Christmas. And I'm Mark Caron. And this is Conscious Living on Co-op Radio, Wednesday night, 6 to 7 p.m., 100.5 FM in Vancouver. And then, of course, available on podcast and um, YouTube and www.consciouslivingradio.org. So welcome. It's going to be an exciting hour here. Our guest, Matthew McKay, is a clinical psychologist, professor of psychology at Wright Institute, co-founder of Haight-Ashbury Psychological Services, founder of Berkeley CBT Clinic, and co-founder of the Bay Area Trauma Recovery Clinic, which serves low-income clients. He's authored and co-authored more than 40 books, including the Relaxation and Stress Reduction Workbook and Seeking Jordan. Today, we're exploring what may await us beyond this life and how to prepare for it. It's a focus derived from his latest thought-provoking book, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife, Jordan's Message to the Living on What to Expect After Death. Welcome to the show, Matthew. I'm so glad to be here. I was so moved by your book. Um, I'm still in it. Uh, You know, I sort of peruse books to get ready for these interviews, but once I started, I could not stop. So I'm really uh, grateful that you're here today and that we get to talk. Can we start with your personal story? Maybe tell us what inspired um, moving towards bringing this book into fruition. Well, I think it starts with Jordan's death. Uh, he was um, uh, coming home from work and accosted by some men and probably wanted his bicycle. And uh, he was shot and killed during a struggle. And I think probably at that moment, I wanted to know what anyone wants to know who's lost someone they love deeply is, does that soul continue to exist? And are they okay? Are they in a place where Mm -hmm. uh, they feel good? Are they, you know, are they happy? And, And so it set me on a journey to find Jordan and I saw him in all kinds of different ways through mediums and shaman, shamanic practices, uh, through um, something called induced after death communication, which is uh, a variant of something called EMDR, which is a way of treating trauma. It's a, something I use as a clinical psychologist to treat trauma. Uh, it's a small variant of that approach that actually can open the channel to hear from the other side. I had that experience, Jordan talking to me directly and feeling his presence and his love. And and so that was part of the journey. Eventually I learned how to channel, to do channeled writing uh, from Ralph Messner, the late Ralph Messner, who was kind of a specialist in after death communication and the nature of the afterlife. So I was on this journey and uh, at some point, you know, I've I've been channeling now with Jordan for a dozen years. And at some point he uh, recognized that we needed to help people who are afraid of death to offer them something that was a vision of what the afterlife really is. And and, uh, in the tradition of the, of the traditional books of the dead to offer them ways to prepare for death and, and, to, and to get clear about what this life is about and, and how to transition into the afterlife. So those are all of the things that he, he mm-hmm. identifies. We have to do that. He outlined the book in about three minutes and we set off to, to do it. And it's, I think I read somewhere, someone called it the ultimate self-help book. Jordan's message is the ultimate self-help book because when you open to that, it, it clearly, it makes it so clear what we have to do on this planet in this incarnation. Um, you know, I have to ask this question because I know there's people who are thinking it when we say the word channel. How do you know, how did you know that the content you were receiving from Jordan wasn't your imagination, your desire? Mm-hmm. Well, and that's a really important question. And, you know, on some level, 
there is no way ever to absolutely prove that channel communications are um, in fact occurring. But there, there's a lot of confirming information. Um, for, first of all, my own subjective experience is that Jordan is telling me things that I've never thought of in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they're, they're absolutely radically new thoughts and cognitions. And, uh, and so I have this experience of receiving something that's new and fresh and not my own. So that, that's, that's one part of the experience. Uh, sometimes, uh, and this, you know, other people who channel talk about this experience of the download, where an enormous amount of information will just show up all at once, and then I have to find words, and and it may take me hours to find the words to describe this complex communication that showed up all at once, and that's just not typical for my consciousness. <laughs> Things don't work like that for me. Uh, and so I, I'm experiencing myself as getting something from outside. So those are some uh, subjective experiences. Uh, on the other hand, there have been confirming, uh, inform this infor confirming information has come, come through from mediums. For example, uh, Austin Wells, who's a well-known medium and uh, uh, knew me a little bit, uh, but didn't, knew nothing about the fact that I was writing a book with Jordan or even anything about Jordan and his death, uh, simply announced to me, oh, you and your son who passed away are, are writing a book together. Well, there's no way she could have known that unless that information had come to her through Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been a lot of those kinds of experiences uh, that were, where I'm getting confirming details from other people about uh, whether they're mediums or, or people who, who have dreams that confirm experiences that they could never have known about. All of this information shows up in a way that gives me a deeper and deeper sense of, of quiet certainty that uh, I am really talking to Jordan. Mm -hmm. And I think reading it as a reader, um, there's, this is the only way I can describe it, a sense of remembering when I'm reading the material. It was really interesting for me. It didn't take me into my head. It didn't take me into um, thinking about death. It, it was an emotional feeling of remembering. And there were some things, and I, I do wanna to touch on them that I'd never thought of that really uh, impacted me, but lots of it was truly a state of, I know that almost like that feeling. It was really quite, quite lovely. So for those of you listening, I, I cannot recommend um, getting your hands on his book um, enough. It's such an incredible read. Um, and, and just back to channeling for a minute, because at the end of the book, you even offer, we are going to dive into what happens because Jordan's book takes you right from his death in his voice um, literally the journey. And it's quite amazing. But at the end of the book, you also offer steps if people want to open to channeling. Can I ask a question about that? Because one of the things you said, um, see, my, my thing, the thing that's always irked me about channeling was when people attribute it to someone. The information has always been quite solid and fantastic. But when people go, oh, it's the whatever from this planet or that planet, when it's the attribution that would always turn me off and I'd go, yeah, that's what human beings like to do. We like to make sense of things. So it, it's being given an identity as opposed to the mystery. It is a mystery. Um, and so at the end, you talk about the steps of channeling. And one of them that struck me was be clear about who you're trying to reach, what entity you're trying to reach. So just say more about that, if you would, because that's really different than going into a meditative state and saying, I'm open to a download. Uh, I think that is important. I, I guess just if I could briefly suggest that anyone in your audience can channel. Mm -hmm. it's, you don't need any special powers. You don't need to be clairaudient. I have no special powers, but uh, I've discovered that channeling, if I could say this is easy, uh, it's not hard to do. And I've taught lots and lots of people to channel, particularly in my 
own work with clients who are dealing with the extraordinary levels of grief, when they learn to channel, it, it's, a, it's a game changer. Now, now, instead of having lost this person, they have a relationship that goes on past death uh, that in some ways can be deeper than the relationship in life. And so channeling is not uh, hard. The, the steps that I follow and that Ralph Messner taught me to use are just simply to get something for a, 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 a talisman that connects you to the person or entity that you wish to reach. And so for Jordan, it's just a small object that belonged to him, which I keep and use uh, as, as, as just a, a, a connecting device, mm -hmm. physical connecting device. Uh, you want to have something that creates eye fixation. Candles work great. You know, something, uh, so a candle that perhaps has a candle holder that you like the design of. You use it and you use it each time. It's, uh, you know, and, and channeling is, is, is helped by ritual. So you have your, your talisman, you have uh, a, a chair or a desk that's familiar and comfortable to you. You have the eye fixation with a candle. And then you just simply begin, a, 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 there's several ways in, but the simplest way is just a Vipassana meditation where you're, uh, you're, you're, you're focusing on your breath, you're noting the in and out of your breath. I count up to 10 for each out breath. And I may do that for se several cycles. Uh, and then uh, you visualize uh, an orb, maybe the, the color of the sun above your head. Uh, and then you watch that elongate all the way up to the spirit world. You simply visualize that orb elongating. And that's the channel. The channel is now open. And um, I encourage people, and, and I often do this myself, well, I'll, I'll write a question out. So it's, it's very helpful to just write things out ask your question, uh, wait. And, 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 the, and, and here's the thing that's important is, is to just allow whatever shows up to, to be there. So if just one word shows up, fine, write that word down. Don't edit it, don't question it, don't judge it, just write it down. You don't know what it means, that's okay. And then you wait. And after a while, a few more words show up and perhaps the end of the sentence. Um, and at some point you feel like the, the answer is somewhat complete, write out another question. And it's as simple as that, uh, writing the questions, but it's getting into that altered state. And, um, and it's a very simple, easy altered state to get into it with a uh, Vipassana meditation. Um, and then using the divination of the, of the white light above your head, all of that is just simply to, to get ready to, uh, to prepare yourself. And once the channel opens, it's just al allowing whatever to show up, whatever mm -hmm. showing up is to, to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, you do say uh, to avoid certain areas like the, re the relief of pain or medical, you know, take this, if someone was suffering or uh, some medical diagnosis to change it, tell us why that's not um, a reason to open that channel or why it certainly won't be effective that way. Yeah, you know, there are several things that Jordan suggests are not, they're not only not ideal, but they're, they're probably ill-advised to, to ask for through channeling. One is to ask about the future because that takes away our free will and we're here to learn and we're here to make the best choices we can make. We can ask for advice, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, from, from any channeled entity on the other side, but to ask for what the future will bring is, not so wise. Um, it's also, it's unwise to ask for some kind of physical intervention from the other side that they're going to, you know, cure an illness or, or get somebody to give you a job uh, or get your favorite team to win so that your bet will, will pay off or whatever, whatever you're hoping for from the other side. Um, to, to ask for those kinds of interventions is uh, my understanding of what Jordan tells me, uh, something that entities are very unlikely to do. Um, they, they want us to work out our own lives and uh, they'll give us help, they'll give us support, they'll guide us. 
but ultimately we have to make our own choices and deal with the pain and circumstances that show up because everything that shows up in our life, including illnesses, is coming for a reason. It's teaching us lessons that are vital and are part of our karmic lesson plan. Mm -hmm. And to get, you know, some entity to help us avoid the lessons is really not, it's not counterintuitive. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. Work. yeah. Well, let's get into the book. So um, let's start with, first of all, people, people nervous or fearful, generally speaking. And here you are kind of opening the whole thing up. Maybe you could take us through um, just the beginning and how your book is laid out and, and how that came through you. Can we start there? Sure. Um, Jordan, in the space of three to five minutes, laid out the entire uh, scope of the book, each chapter basically what it would cover and so forth. And, you know, the first chapter he felt should sort of get, tell the story of his own, his own death and the experience, not only of the immediate aftermath of his death, but, but what was happening in the first few steps into the afterlife. So, so you, everyone could have a firsthand account of that. I mean, Jordan says, there's no better person to tell you about, death in the afterlife than someone who has died. And, mm -hmm. and so he wanted to recount that experience. After that, he looks at pretty systematically the different elements of what, of what our experience is in the afterlife. Uh, what do we do there? What do we learn? Uh, and uh, how, do we, how do we prepare for our next incarnation? So he really looks deeply, how do we move around in the afterlife? Uh, repulsion, what, what is time like in the afterlife? All of these things are topics that he takes up throughout the rest of the book. And what challenges do you think traditional beliefs most of what, um, what he brought to your awareness? What surprised you the most in this information? Well, Jordan takes a very strong position that there is no judgment uh, in the afterlife at all. Uh, no punishment, no kind of hell, uh, and, and so, and, and that our idea of God, you know, as some entity that has, um, you know, the traditional white beard and, you know, reigning on a throne, all these, these ideas are, are really in no way re representational of what is actually there. Uh, God from Jordan's, from what he tells me, we are all God. We are all part of collective consciousness. Uh, we have a role to play. Uh, and so traditional ideas, for example, about God being perfect are also challenged by Jordan. He says very strongly that God or collective consciousness, all there is, whatever we want to call it, source, uh, we are all part of that. All of consciousness is part of God. And God is evolving and we are evolving mm -hmm. uh, as individual souls and entities, but also what this collective that we belong to continues to evolve. And so the idea again, that, that God is perfect is just in, in his view, you know, way off the mark. Uh, and then one other thing I guess I wanted to say about that if I can, is that we come to earth, we incarnate to learn and to evolve as individual souls and everything we learn, and particularly from the, this planet is a very painful place. And, mm -hmm. and pain is our primary teacher. It, it's how, how we learn um, the difference between uh, things we do to ego-driven things versus love-driven things that we do. Pain is, is really the, our primary teacher here and there's no pain in the afterlife. So we come here to learn things that we couldn't learn anywhere else. So souls come to this difficult place. We face pain, we face all kinds of adversity and what Jordan calls friction in this place. And all of that learning becomes part of our individual awareness of souls and then is uploaded to all, to all mm -hmm. of consciousness. And so our, we have this very sacred and beautiful role, which is we, we are, 
you know, our, all the learning we do and all the fa- pain we face, all the struggles we endure, we are helping God evolve. Mm-hmm. So it's both individual and collective at the same time. That's what I'm told. Yeah. And how do we choose uh, this idea that we come to earth and it's a, a, a school here to, of learning? How do, how do we choose a life or a place or a time? How does a soul choose that? What is it based on? Well, in fact, we could choose the next life you or I uh, or Mark could live could be at any point in earth time. So we, we can drop in at any point that there are uh, beings appropriate for an incarnation for a soul to occupy. Um, but in general, we, t- we t- generally we tend to uh, choose lives that are sequential, that, that sort of flow with, with earth time. We choose life, we, we have, uh, we are shown a number of lives uh, that range from lives that may be quite challenging and difficult, but in which a great deal of learning will take place to lives that will be uh, a little less challenging uh, where we consolidate some of, some of what we've learned, um, but we are um, perhaps less likely to get in trouble, uh, if, if I can put it that way. Uh, so. So we're, we face a, a range of choices and souls actually make a choice as to, you know, what next life they want to encounter. And some very ambitious souls will choose rather difficult lives, sometimes lives that are, that are more difficult and more challenging than they have the soul energy or, or the, the, the acquired wisdom to really face. Uh, so we, we make some choices, but each one of these lives will offer a lesson plan. There's a lesson plan built into that life, into that era, into that family, into into the specific situations of our lives, the particular body that we have. They're all all these factors are somehow combined to offer uh, a, a lesson plan, and also a particular point in history where where certain things are going to happen. You know, souls that were born in uh, 1900. We're going to have to face World War One in, in many mm-hmm. cases, and all of the all of the disruption was part of their lesson plan. They they were dropped into places to face certain kinds of experiences, um, and so each of us has an individual lesson plan, and our incarnations are chosen to help advance the learning of that particular lesson plan. And so ultimately, it's up to the soul themselves to decide: Do I want a tough one, or am I going to go a little bit? Uh, lighter this time around like that? My understanding, that? Yeah, my understanding mm-hmm. is that we're offered several lives and we and we get to peer into the Akashic record and learn a little bit about the challenges that particular life w- will involve, mm-hmm. in, including some of the challenges that body may mm-hmm. bring us and certain kinds of illnesses or disabilities and so forth. All of this is, uh, is give, the soul is given a bit of a preview. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, there's now the, there are limited choices, and so it's not like you know you're get you're, you're, you you could be any you could have any life. Uh, you're given a number of limited choices that are all in line with your lesson plan. But within those limited choices, the soul is free to decide you know which of these lives they would want to mm-hmm. live. The beauty so of I, that. Sorry, I, I had a question there, if I may. Mm-hmm. Um, so is what you're saying, Matt, that we can actually choose to incarnate into what we would consider to be um, the past, a past life from two, three, four hundred years ago, a couple of thousand years ago, and live that life? Mm-hmm. Is there, it's an interesting paradox because from, from the spirit world, Jordan tells me they can see the entire history of this planet. And so, you know, every life has, has been lived on some level. Uh, and yet, when we, when we drop into a life, when we, when we parachute in and, and choose a particular life, a particular incarnation, we yet have free will to make any choice that we uh, might make in, 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 to hundreds or even thousands of decisions in the course of that life. So we have free will to make those choices. And yet on some level, 
in the afterlife, all those choices are already known and all of the matrices of cause and effect have already played out to the very end of earth time. And so it's an interesting paradox. And yes, we can drop in at, you know, that you and I could choose a, a life where we would go back uh, and be, um, you know, farmers in, in the Roman era or something. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, that, that's quite possible to do. Most souls, and I guess I'm, I said this a moment ago, will stay with sequential time because they, they don't want to have to have, have such a major adjustment. You know, so a soul that was born in 1900 might incarnate for the next life, you know, in, in 1990 or 2000. Well, you know, a lot of the things that they knew in 1900 are still around. There's cars and there's trains and there's all kinds of familiar objects uh, that that the soul it doesn't have to be, have such a rad, radical adjustment to a, a world that is unfamiliar to them. So that's why they tend to choose these sequential lives. And, and plus you were saying that knowing in advance how things turn out defeats the purpose of the lesson. So if you're choosing a past, uh, something that's already happened and those decisions have been made, I would imagine it feels just listening to it like a bit of a mind mess to make sure that you don't know that information, mm -hmm. right? And we, yeah, Complicated. And when in, yeah, when we come in here, we have, you know, the, we, we cross the river Lethe, the river, river of forgetfulness. Uh, we, we have uh, total, we lose all recall for past lives and what the life between lives is. And, if, and it's just what you said, to, for one reason, to maximize our learning. If we remembered all that, we wouldn't take this seriously. Right. Right. All the struggles, the losses, the, the, yeah. the challenges we face. Yeah. It's like, oh, basically, you know, it's like we're in a little repertory theater here and we're, you know, we're, we're in a green room laughing about all the stuff that's happening to us because it's not, it's not important because we know what's, what's real. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. that doesn't work uh, if we uh, are really going to take these lessons seriously. Right. If I may read a little bit from your book, because I just, I, I, I found it so, um, uh, this whole idea of Matt, it's like manifesting on steroids. Do you mind if I read a few sentences? At the moment of death, we lose our senses, our nervous system, our families and goals in life and find ourselves in a place where a thought creates visions, where an idea projects images that can capture and overwhelm us. And I think what really drew me to that was just this idea that we are so oh if I see it it's real if I hear it it's happening like we as humans and so here you are having just passed over and yet everything's manifesting as you think it but I would imagine that the relationship like how can we prepare now if knowing that that's coming is there something we could be doing now in our human life to prepare to not attach when that happens then because that's an important factor right yeah. when we pass well i'm really glad you brought that up because that's probably the biggest thing we face in the landing place which is where we immediately are, are go to kind of adjust to being in spirit and you know we are there is a a, a kind of a kind of a an, an image that's prepared for us there it's usually something that that, that's con comforting from the planet uh, where we've incarnated some, uh, an image that is peaceful, that gives us a sense of safety, comfort. Uh, and something's been prepared for us. However, we can, because we are individual entities and, and we now are in spirit, whatever we think we can project uh, with, with energy and, and create images. And so, and so our thoughts have this we are in this place where we can manifest any anything we thought think we can see like Jordan described you know he was starting to uh, get very confused as to what was going on he was, uh, saw himself in it, what had been prepared for him was a kind of a garden of you know, this lovely uh, uh, you know green area uh, and but he, he was kind of uncomfortable and he started you know, trying to figure out, well, well, what's, what's really here and anything he thought about, he thought about his house uh, that he grew up in that suddenly he could see the house 
and he thought about his girlfriend and 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 the bedroom they offered, and suddenly he could see that, and and it, it was getting very disturbing to him. And then and then it was suggested that he think of something that he found very peaceful. So he started to think of Yosemite Valley, which he loves. But then he thought of an elephant. Now he has an elephant in Yosemite Valley. And then he thought of some sort of, you know, uh, uh, stomping monster. And now he's got that in Yosemite Valley. And, and so, he, so what he was trying to tell us all is that your thoughts are very powerful. And in the spirit world, they turn into energy forms that we can literally see. And so that's really important to prepare for the spirit world. We have to be aware of that. And and so we have to tune in to what's been prepared for us and also tune into the language of love, which is really how all communications occur in the spirit world. So the, the best way you can prepare for going to that first step is to, is to really um, prepare for and expect to encounter love. I, I guess there's one more thing if I could say about love uh, is that in this, in, in endurances in the same way that the air we breathe on earth is the source of life, but also it's the, how we communicate. We, we create those, those molecules vibrate and it creates sound that we, it's for, and it's how we talk, talk to each other. Well, love is the, the air of the spirit world. It's what, it's what sustains everything, but it also is how all communication occurs through the medium of love. And so if you can't hear love, you can't see love, you can't experience love, you you are what Jordan said is DOA deaf on arrival, and that's and it's very then very hard to move, move deeper into the spirit world because love is how everything is communicated. So, mm. so so that's that's why he says preparing is always done by getting in touch with love, mm -hmm. which we can be doing here right now, right? Seeing through the eyes of love, hearing through the ears of love, even when it's really really tough, right? Yeah. Um, he does say that you retain the physical, the shape of your human body. Now, what if you had physical limitations or some sort of struggle? Is that always true or perhaps only true in his case? I found that interesting that no. in the spirit world, you're retaining that physical, this physical. Well, it, it's sort of a choice, actually. Huh. In, the, in, the, in that environment, in the landing place, we typically retain sort of the shape of our body. We, we sort of have legs, but we don't walk. Um, we, we have what appear to be eyes and ears, but we actually see in all directions and we don't really hear, we, we communicate telepathically. No. So mm -hmm. we, have, we have the, the shape of a body, but all the disabilities, the, the, the organ systems, the sensory apparatus, all of that is gone. And, and, and so we retain some kind of visage that, that you might be familiar says so the, for example when loved ones show up at the landing place and greet us they show up as familiar forms right but th they don't occupy bodies in the way we do when we incarnate they simply take those forms for convenience to create a sense of familiarity and comfort at, mm -hmm. the, at that moment in the landing place and the same thing goes, goes when we go to our uh soul groups we don't really occupy bodies we we can manifest a body uh so that we can appear to each other as we did in our last shared incarnation but that's not a physical body it's something that we simply or we can manifest an environment like in jordan's soul group they 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 they, they have a uh, old victorian mansion that they simply create by by agreement as mm -hmm. as an energy form. So yeah, like an like an energy image. Is, yeah. It sounds like right. Like an and image. so you said earlier that there's no judgment, um, only acceptance. And and my understanding is this landing place. Until we can match a frequency of love, see it, hear it, feel it, we can't actually pass through the veil, let's say my language, but I want to understand also that next piece of the healing place, people who, um, I mean, if there's no judgment, is there accountability? Is there a life review? And how do people who behave badly in this human life? How is that worked with in the healing place? Well, that's important. Now, the first step, once we get into the spirit world, the, the, 
the landing place is sort of an ante room to the spirit world. It's 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 just at the border of the spirit world. Uh, now we can't actually get into the spirit world if we are showing up in that ante room with enormously volatile emotions, anger, sadness, fear, greed. Uh, and if and, and particularly if we've lived a life very dominated by these emotions right. or, or had a death that was dominated by those emotions, um, we can't move right into the spirit world from the landing place. Uh, and, uh, and another corollary of that is if we've caused a lot of pain in our lives, uh, that, that is modeled or, or changed our soul energy in ways that would make it very difficult to get into the spirit world. And in fact, just what you said, we're deaf to love. We can't hear love. We can't, we can't communicate. Uh, so we can't go inside. Uh, and, and so in this, in this anti-world, there are a number of places that we can stop. One is the healing place that, you know, energetically just looks like an outdoor area where people are sleeping, where, uh, the guides minister to them and, and, and help remodel their soul energy, but they may also be dreaming and having experiences that are part of their healing process. Um, but there are bardos as well. There are bardos where, where souls go to, to work through unfinished business in life. Uh, for example, souls that have had a lot of anger and, and, and fought, viciously with others uh, may, they may go to bardos where where there are plots and and uh, uh, essentially storylines that unfold that help them resolve those issues and all, all of which are um, mediated by guides so in the bardos there are all kinds of special uh, learning and, and adjusting that takes place in preparation for finally being ready to enter the spirit world these 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 emotions get processed and finally the, the soul is, is not beset with these strong emotions and impulses anymore. And, and, the, and the healing place and the bardos have done their work to get the soul ready to enter into the, into, into the spirit world itself. However, once you're in the spirit world, the very first stop is life review. So there's more work to be done there. Um, and, and, and you don't even qualify to get into spirit world and life review if you're still dealing with overwhelming emotions and, and um, uh, behaviors that cause harm. But once in, now the very first place you go is the life review, which is a very challenging uh, moment in, in, souls, in a soul's history. Right. Why would a, a soul choose to have a life that causes harm when we think of some of the really the evils, I'm going to use that word that people, the atrocities that people have committed as human beings. Why would a soul choose to have that kind of experience if it in fact did? Well, that's, I think my understanding is that souls gen don't generally choose to have lives in, in which they would perpetrate evil, but souls may choose a body in a circumstance that's very challenging that that really is offered offers challenges greater than their capacity to respond uh, and i mean here's part of the problem i mean and this is why the earth is a very difficult place uh, the, the human body is so beset with hormones and uh intense emotion our limbic system is very reactive and intensely emotional uh, we we often behave in, in ways that are very reactive without without a whole lot of thinking. Um, a lot of human beings don't have much connection between their prefrontal cortex, where they reason, and their limbic system, where they have these emotional intense reactions. So we live in these bodies that are very that are volatile, uh, uh, impulsive, um, driven often by emotions, but also not just by emotions, but by desire, by uh, by the pursuit of pleasure. So what happens is that souls, particularly young souls, souls that have had not have a, had a whole lot of incarnations, get into these bodies that just just run run the show. You know, their body dominates. So, so they're just they're just all about pleasure. They're all about avoiding pain, and 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 they're really not very in touch with anybody else's struggle or pain. 
they're very egocentric. And so these souls end up being in, 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 in a lot of danger in terms of, you know, getting caught into situations and, and events in their lives where they can cause harm. So yes, we, uh, we can, we, we don't choose bodies and, and moments in, in time and history where we expect to do harm. Sometimes we have a lot of hubris and we think, oh, I can manage that. I, I'll, de I'll deal with that situation. I can, you know, uh, and, and yet the, the soul doesn't have the knowledge, the energy, the wisdom, uh, the experience to manage that body, those challenges, that moment in history. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about, I, I think Jordan said somewhere in the book that, that there's more fun in the afterlife than there is on earth, which I thought was delightful. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, you know, there's a lot that goes on in the afterlife that we, we sort of, you know, it, <laughs> one, one of the things that, um, you know, we get from tra some traditional Christian ideas of of the afterlife is, you know, we're up there playing harps and sitting in clouds and all that stuff. That's just not what's happening. And um, we spend most of our time with our soul group, which is our family, uh, very closely involved with them. Uh, and that time can be spent in lots of different ways. Some of it is actually involves merging where, where, where our soul energy merges together, which is very pleasurable, lovely experience of, of knowing each other perfectly and, uh, loving and approving and appreciating each other deeply while, while being almost transparently merged. And that's a very lovely experience that happens in soul groups. But a lot of the time in soul groups is spent uh, actually doing more learning. Uh, guides are helping us acquire new knowledge. We do a lot of review of the Akashic record, reviewing the life just lived, uh, but also learning about um, other lives, uh, experiences on other planets. Um, so we can study any kind of, any part of the Akashic record, uh, any, any life, any moment in history on earth or any other planet where we incarnate. So there's a lot of time spent doing that. And what, this is one of the things that I find so interesting is that we can use the Akashic record as, as, for what if quests. What if I had done X instead of Y? And literally we can open the record and we can see a whole ch future chain of cause and effect. It's like an altered uh, reality it's a, or, or, or a parallel universe of all the things that would have happened over many years to many different people if I had only made this other choice. And we can watch that, we can read it like we're reading a book and observe everything that occurs. And then we close it and that becomes null. It, it, it no longer exists. It, it only exists as a moment, a potential moment uh, and it ceases to be real. So we can study history looking at every choice that was made by every human being potentially and looking at how that choice would have played out if it was made differently. So there's just an enormous amount of learning that can go on in the afterlife. I mean, that's, I mean, that's another thing. There's another thing is tourism. Uh, souls spend a lot of time, first of all, visiting each other uh, not just in their own soul group, but, you know, visiting, uh, going across vast distances to visit with other souls, to bring their energy there. But they also engage in tourism to visit uh, their home planet, uh, other planets on which incarnations occur. Uh, and so there's a lot of tourism uh, for the purpose of just learning or, and, and kind of educating themselves. It's like um, same reason we look at travel logs on television. There's mm -hmm. a lot of that. That's the kind of thing that goes on in the spirit world. A lot of recreation, a lot of music, um, games. Uh, there's, there's a lot of the, 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 the creativity that we have here. There, there are elements of that in the uh, spirit world. Uh, we actually create sculptures out of, out of energy and so forth. I mean, so there's a lot of creativity in, in the soul, uh, in the spirit world. A lot of skill training. Souls are learning uh, th their, um, kind of uh, their, their career, they have, they, have, they have soul careers or um, a, a careers in spirit, very different from what we have on earth, but they're, they're learning things like how to, how to be, um, 
how to uh, you know how to how to how to mentor other souls how to be guides uh healers and so forth so there, there are all these um careers in spirit that our souls are in various stages of learning so there's so many things going on up there that are incredible but all, almost all that has to do with learning creating or enjoying and recreating and you're available to make contact with people who are still embodied to the yes the, which is you know, really, really yeah. lovely. <laughs> it is lovely because the thing that Jordan has said to me that was, I, I think, the very healing to me and um, has meant so much is that there, there really is no difference between the living and the dead. The, these relationships that we have continue. Uh, they continue deeply. They're strongly felt on both sides. And that... Um, the soul on the other side is just a thought away. As soon as you think of that soul on the other side, you're starting to open the channel it, they, and they are automatically beginning to, to connect to you. So just the thought, they're just a thought away. And then we can very deliberately open a communication channel through channel writing or just channeling and say it itself, ask questions, get answers. And um, so that's something that's been very important to me to know that these relationships if anything, if anything, are stronger, deeper, and more full of love than they were when we were embodied. The other thing I read that I had never thought of was that my soul is there now. It's yeah. here and there. And I really, there was something so comforting when I thought, wow, I'm already dead. Like there's a part of me that's in the spirit world. Yeah doing everything we've been talking about, studying, whatever, but available both for me to access and to learn from. It gave me a sense of, um, it sort of eased that deep spiritual longing immediately and connected me with everything because that's me. That's not like you say, some God in a cloud that I'm separate from. That's my soul. It was lovely. That piece was just, I'd never really thought of it that way. And it made quite a difference in how I felt about um, communication. Do you want we to say all, something? Yeah, you know, we're all together in our afterlife. The afterlife. We're, we all remain there. There's a Hindu concept of Atman and Jiva. And Atman is the part of our soul that always remains in the afterlife. Oh, some of our spirit is always there. Yeah. And, and the other thing I think that's important is that you can channel your own higher self. Right. You can, if you, you can make the address of your channel communication yourself in spirit with all of the knowledge you have, all of your awareness of incarnations, yeah. uh, all, your entire soul history is actually available and, 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 that, and that part of you, you can talk to. Well, and, and as a therapist, psychotherapist, I help clients access that. We don't use the words your soul or God or anything else, but that place is accessible just by deepening and opening to that, the unconscious information that flows through. And everybody can do that too. It's such, it's such a, a powerful piece, I think. I, I did want to ask you, are, is your birth family necessarily your soul family? No. Okay, good to, now, good to know. However, <laughs> that's, that's going to be a great relief. But I, I will say this, though, that um, we, our, our, our soul groups are, you know, we, we incarnate together oftentimes. And so mm. uh, our soul group, we may have, you know, people in our family who are part of our soul group. But it's, it's not that they're joined to us. It's not, the idea is not so much that they're joined to us by blood. It's that, that we have various relationships in each, in each incarnation. Uh, sometimes, you know, two souls will be mother and son. Sometimes two souls will be lovers. Sometimes two souls will be teacher and pupil or adversaries. Or, you know, they can have all these different relationships that they get to experience over the course of many lifetimes. And how can you recognize your soul tribe on this when we're on this planet? Do you have... Yes, I think there are ways. And one way is, I mean, you've had this experience, I'm sure both of you, where you have this sudden leap of recognition, you, you, you meet somebody and you feel like you've known them for years and you don't know why, and you feel kind of inclined to tell them things you wouldn't ordinarily tell uh, somebody uh, on, on just meeting them. Uh, and and there's, so that, that's a real thing. Uh, and I think that that sense of, of 
I, I know you from somewhere is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a part of recognizing when we've run across uh, somebody from our soul group. Uh, now it can be a little dangerous because sometimes we can run across people from our soul group uh, that are really wouldn't be a very appropriate partner, but we have that feeling of recognition and we confuse it with falling in love. And, uh, and they may not be, uh, you know, a terribly appropriate uh, life partner or romantic partner mm -hmm. for us. So do you have any, um, do you do events or talks or do you have anything you want to share with our listeners to, so they can find out or stay in contact with you and find out more what you're up to? I, I do events. I, there's nothing scheduled at the moment, but I, um, if somebody wanted to reach me, they can reach me on my, in my uh, email, uh, matt, M-A-T-T at newharbinger.com, N-E-W-H-A-R-B-I-N-G-E-R.com. If somebody needs to reach me, I'm happy to respond. Any final thoughts on softening the fear of death for those listening? Although I think this interview has really done that. If we, you know, if a person opens to it, there's a lot to look forward to. I guess the, the thing, if I could just leave with yeah. the, the, these ideas that we are always together, the living and the dead, we are always together. This is just an illusion that there's a veil separating us. Uh, and we're, we are always part of the whole. Each, of, each soul, we're always part of the whole. We're connected to each other. We're all deeply family on some level. Uh, and we're always united in love. That I never changes. And, um, you know, this aloneness that we feel in this place is just an illusion that's created for our growth. And in, in truth, we are never alone. We are always joined. We are always connected. And our relationships always thrive with love. And no matter what pain or suffering you're going through, there's um, a nugget in there. There's actually a jewel or a pearl or something for you right now like not in not later but right now or it's there to mine and and find and i think when people feel they're at um being held hostage by something that's a very empowering thought to go wait a minute i was involved in the creation of this and there's something really good in this situation even if it was tragic or or painful yeah well, I have loved talking with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the book is available, what, on Amazon, most pla like basic places, yeah? Everywhere books are sold, uh, Barnes & Noble. Again, The Luminous Landscape of the Afterlife. Get it. It's amazing. Jordan's message to the living on what to expect after death. We've been speaking with Matthew McKay. Thanks again, Matthew. Thank you, Tasha. Mark, appreciate it. Okay, bye, everyone. Go live.